Your girl had to do what she had to do, okay? Hey peeps, welcome back to my YouTube channel. It is your girl Chelsea, and I am back with another video. So, as you can see by the title of this video, you probably already know, or maybe you don't know, where I'm going with this. So, basically, I quit the medical spa. So, I'm going to give you guys like a little life update based off of what's going on right now, and then we're also going to dive into some common emergencies that you will see in the ER. So, to start with the medical spa, Y'all don't come for me now. I know I said that I was not going to go back to the hospital, but you know, your girl had to do what she had to do, okay? So yes, I did quit the medical spa for many reasons. First off, because I was the only employee for about six months, six to seven months of the time that I was working there, so basically from January to about June, I was the only employee and I was basically managing everything there. Over time, I really missed being intellectually challenged. So I think that was one big thing for me was that I did miss the critical thinking skills that I had from the hospital and constantly being able to critically think. When I was at the medical spa, basically I was doing 100% of IV hydration. So I went into it thinking that I was going to be doing Botox, fillers, you know, microdermabrasion, PRP, chemical peels, a lot of that stuff, and it turned out that 100% of it, I was just doing IV hydration. So over time, it became like very tedious, it wasn't challenging for me, and I just got bored, honestly, I did. My third reason is that ultimately, there were things that were agreed upon in the beginning of employment that were not followed through, which became misleading over time. And lastly, working five times a week as the only employee for the amount of time that I did, I think it just became too much because if I wanted to go on vacation, preferably a paid vacation, or if I wanted to take a day off, there was nobody there to cover me. So I felt like that I had to be there at all times, all five days of the week, and I couldn't take any time to myself. So that became draining over time. So again, I needed that reassurance that I was going to be taken care of well as an employee. And because I wasn't receiving that type of reassurance or that type of treatment, that is the reason why I decided to quit. Now that you guys are updated on that whole situation, if you have any questions about it, you guys can definitely leave a comment down below. But we are going to go ahead and skip ahead and get to the reason why I am making this video. So, I have about seven common emergencies that you will see in the ED department. The reason why I'm going over these seven common emergencies is because I will be starting in the ED department today. Today I actually had some orientation that I had to get done, but I also have to run to the hospital shortly. So I decided to come on here and update you guys and also give you some tips for if you are interested in the emergency department. So my background is actually ER tech, but I also was an ER nurse for a little bit of time. So going back to the ER department is something that I am familiar with, but I do have to kind of re-familiarize myself with a lot of the skills that I may have forgotten after being out of the hospital for the amount of time that I was. So one of the most common things that you'll see in the hospital as far as ER is going to be chest pain. So chest pain is very, very common, very, very serious, especially if it is a myocardial infarction. And what that is, is basically a heart attack. So you have a couple things that you definitely want to do before that patient does arrive, a lot of prepping that you may want to do, especially if it is a confirmed MI. Some of the things that I would definitely recommend that you remember is MONA. MONA is an acronym that is actually found in the Nursing Made Insanely Easy book, and I'll actually link that down below for you guys because I'm an acronym person, so I thought I'd go ahead and mention this acronym that's easy to remember for chest pain. So with MONA, it stands for morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. Those are the four things that you want to definitely do as soon as your patient arrives to the ER. Because they're going to be in excruciating pain, especially if it is an MI, you're going to want to provide oxygen to them as well as aspirin to kind of slow down the process. 
and nitro also helps with their blood pressure as well as their heart rate too. You also want to get an EKG. That is the very first thing that you want to do so you can confirm that it actually is a MI. You also want to draw tropes. Tropes are your troponin levels. Those are cardiac enzyme level indicator. So you definitely want to draw those, but honestly, if it is an MI, even if it isn't, it's better to be safe than sorry. Go ahead and draw a rainbow lab level. So a rainbow level is basically drawing all of the blood levels that you may need, just in case they actually have to go to the cath lab. One big thing that I will mention that I want you guys to remember is that chest pain is going to be shown differently in women. So in women, women will exhibit diaphoresis, which is basically excessive sweating. They will also have shortness of breath, but mainly they are going to exhibit epigastric pain. And what that is is basically upper stomach pain. For men, a lot of times they'll have the cardiac chest pain, they'll also have the arm pain, as well as a little bit of jaw pain as well. So women are going to differ with men when it comes to their symptoms, if they are having an MI or they may be having chest pain. So definitely remember that. And lastly, for this tip, I want to mention that time is so crucial with chest pain. They're going to require that you have a door to balloon policy. And every hospital is different with what they're gonna require as far as your policies. They're going to recommend that you have up to 90 minutes before you get the patient to the cath lab if they are in fact having an MI. So make sure you guys pay attention to your hospital policy based off of what you need to know for an MI. My second one is sepsis. So sepsis is very, very common in the hospital, especially in the ER. A lot of people wait till the last minute before they get checked out for something. So something as small as a toothache, you know, that develops into an infection, that can lead to sepsis, as well as a UTI. A UTI can get very, very bad, trust me, I know. You know, and you don't want to wait till the last minute before that starts to spread throughout your body. With a toothache, it can spread throughout your bloodstream. With a UTI, it can go into your kidneys and start affecting other things in your body. So don't wait until it's too late. Please do not wait. With sepsis, you're going to have the fever. You're also going to have shortness of breath possibly, dizziness, low blood pressure, as well as tachycardia, which is your increased heart rate. So if those things start to happen, most hospitals, if not all hospitals, are going to have a like red stop thing that pops up on your screen when you're charting those vital signs because it's going to indicate that you need to check this patient out for sepsis criteria. My third common emergency in the ER is going to be a stroke. So with the stroke, you want to remember the acronym FAST. For FAST, what it stands for is facial, arm, speech, in time. All of those things are very, very important when it comes to a stroke because time is of essence. Like if you don't catch a stroke within, you know, minutes, actually after 30 minutes, a lot of those deficits have already started to come into play as far as like speech, you know, um, numbness, tingling. A lot of those deficits, if you catch it too late, they can be irreversible. With the stroke, you want to definitely rule out if it is an ischemic stroke or if it's a hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic just means that it is a brain bleed. Ischemic means that there is like a lack of oxygen to the brain. So if it is a hemorrhagic stroke, then you cannot, cannot give TPA. TPA is basically a blood thinner, a maximum blood thinner. So if they're having a hemorrhagic stroke and they're having a brain bleed, you do not want to give a blood thinner to make them bleed out more. Does that make sense to my non-nursing people? Does that make sense? I hope it does. With TPA, like I said, most hospitals have a certain policy. With TPA, I know that um, one hospital that I worked at, I think it was within like four hours or 4.5 hours of initial symptoms of the stroke. So as soon as they have those first symptoms, you have within 4.5 or four hours to administer TPA if it is a non-hemorrhagic stroke. My fourth one is going to be a triple A. Triple A stands for abdominal aortic aneurysm. These are very, very serious, especially if they are too large because they can rupture in a amount of seconds and the person can bleed out within an amount of minutes. 
So they're very, very serious. If they are small, then you definitely can possibly get it surgically repaired. But if they are too large, then you just continue to monitor it, honestly. Triple A's are very common in men who smoke cigarettes, especially. And what you can see is actually a pulsing around their navel area, which may indicate a triple A. My fifth common emergency that you will see in the ER is going to be a GSW. So depending on where you work at, I worked in Detroit and I've seen plenty of, you know, GSWs, honestly, throughout my lifetime of working as a nurse, which is about three years. GSWs are very common in inner city areas. So a GSW is a gunshot wound. These are very serious because if it is a multiple GSW, it's going to be bad most likely and with gsws you want to make sure that you are prepping before they even get to your hospital so they are of course a priority one and you want to make sure you have like a chest tube ready Foley catheter a level one if you don't know what a level one is it basically is a mass blood transfuser Speaking of blood, you also want to have a transfusion, like, you know, O negative blood. You want to also call surgery possibly because they're going to more than likely need to go up to surgery to have the bullets removed and have things repaired. You want to make sure you get a CT, see if any of those bullets have hit any major organs. If it is a minor GSW, you may not need all of those things depending on where it is in the body but you want to always prep just in case the worst does happen. With GSWs, you want to make sure that you're protecting their airway at all times and you have lots of pain meds because a gunshot wound, I've never been shot before, but as I can imagine, it is probably pretty painful. Depending on where you get shot at, really, in general, GSWs are going to be painful. So you want to have pain meds on deck for that patient when they arrive. My number six common emergency that you'll see in the ER is a fall. So, it seems to be all the old ladies and old men are always falling during the holidays. Like, I don't know if they just decide to hang up Christmas lights and they fall off of ladders, you know, they fall all types of kind of ways. They fall in the bathroom, they slip in the tub, which is, I mean, I've slipped in the tub before, so, and I'm not an old person, so I, you know, it happens, but, so falls are very common, especially during the holidays. You want to find out if that patient has fallen on thinners. If they fell and they're on blood thinners like Plavix, you definitely want to take different precautions for that patient than somebody who has not fallen on thinners. Because if they fall on thinners, they could possibly have a brain bleed or they can bleed out somewhere if they hurt a certain organ, all kinds of things. So you want to find that out like immediately when you're triaging that patient. With the fall, you want to make sure that this patient is only on bathroom privileges assisted if you trust them to walk. If you don't, they can go on a bedpan, they can use a urinal if they're a male. But you want to have a bed alarm on them, you always want to have those fall non-slip socks on. And you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on them, checking on them, doing your hourly rounding. You may want to round on them more frequently, especially if they're a confused patient. And my last common emergency that you'll see in the ER is allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is when they go into shock. So if they're allergic to bee stings, they can go into anaphylactic shock within a matter of minutes. So it's very, very crucial that those people have an EpiPen on them, and as soon as they use their EpiPen, they have to come straight to the ER. If they are not in anaphylactic shock, but they just had an allergic reaction to something, then you definitely wanna make sure that you're maintaining their airway. You want to get steroids, so solumedrol is the big one. Pepsin also, if they ingested something, Pepsin is going to help with their stomach and protect the lining of it. And then you also want to have Benadryl. Benadryl, yes, it makes you sleepy, but most of us have used Benadryl for allergic reactions or any kind of like allergies or something. That is another common thing that you may see in the ER. So I really appreciate you guys for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed my life update. I had to get you guys updated on what was going on in my life. I know I haven't really spoken much about it, but now I definitely can. I'm so, so, so excited to start back in the ER, honestly, because I kind of miss the craziness, to be honest with you. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that it gave you a lot of insight on the things that we will experience in the ER. 
Um, if you are a person who is interested in going into the ER, definitely leave a comment down below of any questions that you guys may have. And then make sure you guys like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Although my passion is definitely doing aesthetics and doing facials and things like that, I think that if I did decide to go back into the medical spa, it would most likely be like PRN. But honestly, right now, I'm just like so busy with the ER and doing like all the classes and things like that. So I don't see that in my future for now. But I don't know. We'll see. We will see. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day.